How could you? I screamed, my voice echoing through the empty lot where our family home once stood. All that remained was a pile of rubble. I spotted Trent casually leaning against his BMW, sipping his daily Starbucks as he scrolled on his phone without a care in the world. He slowly looked up. Oh, hey, babe. Welcome back, he said flatly. While you were off finding yourself at that retreat, I took care of a little house project for us. My hands trembled and tears stung my eyes. I had just returned from a wellness retreat in the mountains, hoping to regain my strength after losing Mom. Now I came home to this violation. A little project? Trent, this was our home, I shouted. You demolished our 25-year life without even telling me? He shoved his phone in his suit pocket and strode towards me, his imposing figure casting a shadow my way. I stood firm. Eliza, that old place was getting run down anyway, and we could really use your inheritance money to build ourselves a nice new modern home. His voice turned from nonchalant to a growl. I flashed back to our wedding day when I saw that sparkle in his eyes. Now all I saw was cold, hard greed. My inheritance? Is that what this is about? I asked in disbelief. You destroyed our family home, my memories with mom, just to get your hands on my money? Our money, or at least it should be. Trent fired back, his temper rising. I'm fed up with you keeping everything separate. The inheritance, your savings. We're married. After everything I've given you, the luxury cars, the country club membership, our children's college funds, you owe me. I stood speechless, rage and heartbreak swirling inside me. This was the man I once loved with my full heart. Lucas and Sophie's father. Now he was a stranger consumed by avarice. Trent, you supported this family because it's your responsibility, not some favor you did me. I was the one working long hours in the classroom while you whined and dined your CEO friends. My voice grew louder, bolstered by a lifetime's worth of suppressed resentment. Well, one of us had to bring money into this family, though it seems teaching second graders doesn't pay like it used to, he scoffed. That tore it. I swung my hand swiftly, slapping him hard across the face. The sound cracked through the empty space where warm family memories once echoed. For a moment, his face registered shock. Then his lips curled into a menacing smile. You'll regret that, Eliza, he growled, stomping back towards his flashy car. That inheritance is mine. You can make this easy or difficult, but either way, I'll get what I deserve. I stood alone among the ruins of my life, my mother gone, my home demolished, my husband transformed into a monster. I had dedicated years to my family, putting their needs before my own. Now Trent threatened to steal my last ounce of security, convinced he was owed a cut simply for being my spouse. I sank down atop a pile of gravel that once supported our living room. This man thought he could scare me into submission, believing I'd back down as I always had. The old Eliza may have acquiesced, terrified of conflict, and desperate to keep the peace. But losing Mom showed me how fragile life was. I refused to surrender myself any longer. Gripping a chunk of drywall that displayed Lucas's childhood height measurements, I made a vow. Trent underestimated my strength if he expected me to hand everything over. I would fight with my last breath to protect myself and my children. With tears drying and resolve hardening, I marched forward, the demolition debris crunched under my feet, remnants of the past, fuel for my future. I was battered but not broken. Now focused by righteous fury, I pulled out my phone to call the one person I knew would help. Hello, Claire? It's Eliza. I hope you still have room on your caseload because I need the best divorce lawyer in town. Sitting across from Claire over lukewarm coffees, I delved back into memories I had long suppressed. Eliza, walk me through your relationship history with Trent, Claire said gently, her voice belying her reputation as a bulldog in the courtroom. I closed my eyes, transported back over two decades prior. It was 1998, and at 23 years old, I was focused on kick-starting my teaching career. Trent was an up-and-coming sales executive I met through family friends. Confident and charismatic, he swept me off my feet quickly. We married within a year, and by 30, I had left my job to focus on raising our children full-time. It was always my dream to be a mom. Trent was thrilled, too. He wanted me home, tending to the kids, while he traveled for work. I strived to be the perfect wife and mother. My parents helped tremendously while Trent was away. We were a close, loving family, up until six months ago when we lost my father unexpectedly. 
My mother's health, then, took a sharp decline, following Dad's passing. I'm so sorry, Eliza. Claire offered gently. That must have been an incredibly painful time for you. How did Trent respond? I sighed, anger rising as I replayed his apathetic behavior in my mind. Honestly, Trent grew increasingly impatient and cold. He hated that I was preoccupied caring for my grieving mother. He began making callous comments about me, playing nurse too much. Claire frowned, jotting notes on her legal pad. And he provided no emotional support during this period? None whatsoever. If anything, he often compounded my grief with his cruel reactions. My mind drifted back to one piercing incident. Mom and I were reviewing some old photo albums together, laughing and crying as we relived nostalgic memories. Trent came home unexpectedly early from a work trip. Ugh, is this what my house has turned into? A pity party patch? He had grumbled. Trent! I scolded. Have some compassion. Mom just lost her husband of forty years. And I just want my wife back! This melancholy scene needs to end. He stormed off to pour himself a scotch. Mom's fragile smile had vanished instantly, replaced by resigned sadness. We didn't look at the albums again. I shook my head, drawn back to the present moment across from Claire. So there you have it. The man I once loved disappeared, consumed entirely by selfishness. And now— my voice quivered as I recounted the image seared into my mind of our demolished home, of Trent's unconscionable betrayal. Claire leaned forward, her expression shifting to righteous anger. Don't worry, Eliza. We're going to make him pay. Over the next weeks under Claire's counsel, I dug up documents, financial records, and Trent's vicious text messages. She was confident this evidence would land a favorable judgment. We sat across her wide oak desk reviewing our plan when Claire's phone lit up. She glanced at the screen and her eyebrows shot up. Well, speak of the devil. It's a text from Trent. He says he wants to meet to discuss things civilly. He must have gotten wind that you lawyered up. Claire let out an icy laugh. My stomach churned, imagining his scheme. There's no way I'm agreeing to some fake meeting just for him to intimidate me more. I know, I know, Claire agreed. She stared pensively at her phone screen as a sly smile crept across her face. The wheels were clearly spinning behind her intelligent eyes. Actually, Eliza, I have an idea. She leaned forward, resolve emanating from her. What if we use this text to set a little trap for your scheming husband? I nodded cautiously, as she detailed a plan to meet Trent under the guise of good-faith negotiations. But with Claire secretly recording the conversation, we could obtain hard proof of Trent's coercion and threats. My anxiety melted into tentative relief at the finally holding him accountable. As we wrapped up final preparations for the clandestine meeting, I turned to Claire, new confidence rising within me. Let's do this. It's time for that snake to get exactly what he deserves. Claire smiled knowingly and put a steadying hand on my shoulder. Showtime! My hands trembled as I stared down at the text from Trent confirming our clandestine meeting spot a discreet café downtown far from prying eyes. Though Claire and I had devised an airtight plan to expose his deceit, doubt still gnawed at my core. What verbal assaults awaited me? How far would Trent go to pressure me into relinquishing control of my inheritance? I steeled my nerves, refusing to let past anxiety dictate my actions now. With my family's legacy and financial future at stake, failure was not an option. I arrived early at the nondescript café and selected a quiet corner booth, my back to the wall for full visual coverage. I set my phone on the table discreetly pressing record before concealing it behind a napkin. The bait was laid for Trent's inevitable tirade. Now confident our trap was set, I waited. Right on cue, fifteen minutes late as always, Trent sauntered in, a smug look plastered across his handsome yet hardened face. I gestured politely to the seat across from me. Showtime. Well, Eliza, isn't this mature of us to handle things civilly? Trent offered with mock sincerity. I nearly gagged at his attempt to take the high road after demolishing our family home without notice. Instead, I offered a flat smile. Yes, I think it's important we have an open and honest conversation about all this. Trent shifted, clearly unsettled by my nonplussed reaction. He was likely expecting a much more volatile response he could redirect with manipulation as he had done so many times before. Good. Let him squirm a bit. I broke the silence after an awkward beat. I'll cut right to the chase, Trent. 
Are you willing to negotiate fairly on separation terms? I kept my tone cool yet firm. At this, Trent sneered. The polite facade instantly melted away. Separation? He spat the word. You must be joking. I hope you're not expecting me to agree to anything that compromises my financial future. Compromises his future? Typical Trent. Money and status were all that mattered to him. Certainly not family. I pressed on calmly. I'm talking about splitting things equitably between us. Surely we can be reasonable adults. Trent pounded his fist on the table, rattling the coffee mugs and startling patrons at other tables. No, Eliza, I will not agree to walk away empty-handed. Not after wasting the prime of my career on this lackluster marriage, he jabbed bitterly. You will sign over your inheritance, or I'll make you regret ever threatening this divorce. And there it was, no pretense anymore about preserving our family or saving our marriage. Trent laid bare his singular goal, getting his greedy hands on what he felt he deserved. Behind his macho threats, though, I detected desperation. His future fortune and reputation were at stake if he couldn't manipulate me into conceding. This time he underestimated my resolve. I kept my tone measured. Are you quite finished with your tirade? Because nothing you say will coerce me into just handing everything over. I'm fully prepared for a legal battle. Trent's face reddened, his temper rising. But I recognized the flash of fear behind his harsh glare. My stoic confidence had caught him off guard. You entitled, washed-up loser, he sputtered. I made you everything you have, and this is the thanks I get? You'll regret this, Eliza. No one steals my future. With that, Trent shoved his chair back forcefully, grabbed his jacket, and stormed out, steaming. My hands were trembling again, though this time with relief and triumph. I grabbed my phone, hands shaking, to stop the recording. Not only did I hold firm in my refusal to cave to his threats, I now had them all on tape. But no more hiding behind a charming veneer. The world would soon hear Trent's true venomous nature. For the first time in months, I broke into a grin. My tormentor's downfall was imminent. With Claire masterfully pulling legal strings and karma beginning to strike back at Trent for his deceit, I had set the stage for his reckoning. I almost pitied the poor guy if he wasn't such a loathsome snake, willing to crush his own family for personal gain. Oh well. No mercy for the selfish fool. After settling my bill, I strode confidently out the door towards a future that shined brighter by the minute. My resolve was steeled for the fight ahead. Trent would bitterly regret the day he crossed me. I sighed, seeing the caller ID flash Trent for the third time that morning. After ignoring his barrage of petty texts, he was apparently resorting to voice messages to vent his frustration. My finger hovered over the decline button when a thought struck me. Trent's behavior had become increasingly erratic and abusive. Building a record of evidence couldn't hurt for the looming legal battle. I answered coolly, what do you need, Trent? His voice came through the speaker shrill and commanding. We need to discuss funeral arrangements for your mother. I already contacted my preferred venue and caterer and put a deposit down. I figured you'd be too emotional to handle planning. My breath caught in my throat. The audacity after months of dismissing my grief, now assuming control and decision-making because I was too hysterical? I managed a terse response. Actually, Trent, I've already made arrangements with Mom's church and her closest friends are helping coordinate everything. But I'm sure your caterer refunds deposits if you ask nicely. I couldn't help the subtle jab, indicating his presumptuous planning was not required or appreciated. An exasperated sigh followed by a lengthy pause echoed from the phone. When Trent spoke again, any veil of compassion had vanished, revealing biting contempt. You always were helpless when it came to executive decisions. I don't know why I'm surprised you'd leave the planning to a bunch of old church biddies barely clinging to life themselves. I clenched my phone tightly, holding back a spew of enraged curses. Breathe, Eliza. His cruelty shocking as it may sound on tape could be critical evidence if he tried claiming I was the bitter, unreasonable one later. I responded evenly. I'm organizing this funeral in alignment with Mom's wishes— something you never bothered to learn in twenty-five years together. She will be honored respectfully. Please just let me handle this, Trent. Another tense pause followed. For a moment I thought he may have hung up. Then came a chilling clipped reply. Fine, Eliza. Throw your quaint little funeral tea party. 
but don't expect me to stand around making small talk with those religious fanatics. And not a penny extra from my accounts. The line clicked dead. I released a shuddering breath and collapsed onto our bed, which Trent had strategically left stripped of all bedding. Even in death, he continued finding new psychological torture methods. Over the next days, his cruelty only crescendoed. As I sorted through Mom's belongings with supportive friends, he ridiculed the task as feeble sentimentality. When our son Lucas came to help with cleaning, Trent's calm facade broke. Don't you have exams to be focusing on instead of wasting time on redundant housework? He had berated our stunned son. All this could have simply been hauled off to goodwill instead of drama queen Eliza's tedious emotional purge. Lucas retreated from the house quickly after that, clearly pained by his father's escalating bitterness. My heart broke, envisioning the distance growing between Trent and the children. He was willing to sever even these bonds in his rabid pursuit of assets and pride. The day of Mom's funeral arrived, gray and weary, mimicking my turbulent mindset. As I dressed in a simple black gown, Trent emerged shirtless, sipping his morning beer. His appearance mirrored the disregard he had shown Mom even while alive. Give my well wishes to the brainwashed Bible Brigade, he offered snidely. Hot tears stung behind my eyes. I slipped silently out the door into the drizzling rain. The showers disguised streaming tears as I drove to the church. Surrounded by true loved ones there, the service was filled with tender moments, honoring Mom's generous soul. Trent's absence went largely unnoticed. While it pained me he had abandoned us at this sacred time, Trent's recurring callous treatment solidified my will. Any lingering hesitation to push forward on severing ties vanished. His efforts to intimidate me into obedience had only affirmed suspicions of abuse for years. Now with clear-cut proof, I was determined to fight back legally. As we laid Mom's rose-adorned casket to rest beside Dad, the rain subsided, leaving glimmering puddles in the cemetery grass. The clouds parted, revealing hints of hopeful blue skies beyond life's storms. Gazing into the light, I knew Mom and Dad were cheering me on proudly, and Trent's reckoning awaited on the horizon. Sitting across from Claire reviewing the latest legal documents, I finally felt empowered and in control. Though Trent continued his petty power moves, I now had the law on my side. With the testimony and evidence you've provided, we've compiled an ironclad case, Claire assured me, gathering up papers into a leather folio. Her fiery confidence fueled my own. I'm certain the judge will rule in your favor regarding financial separation, and with documented proof of emotional abuse, you'll easily be granted full custody of your children. A wave of relief washed over me at this prospect. Securing Lucas and Sophie's well-being through the volatile divorce was my priority. Trent's influence had become downright toxic. Protecting them legally would provide peace of mind. You've worked wonders, Claire, I offered sincerely. I honestly don't know if I could have come out on top in this fight without you navigating the complex legal channels. Claire smiled humbly, handing me copies of the documents. I'm happy to play my part, but truly, Eliza, your courage and refusal to be intimidated is what's winning the day here. Don't forget that inner strength. Her words resonated with my core. For so long I had minimized my resilience, believing Trent was the trailblazer. Now clarity revealed I was the foundation holding everything together behind the scenes, and I deserved equitable compensation for my sacrifices. Buoyed by this insight, I practically floated out the law office doors ready to embrace the next phase with renewed moxie. My steps halted abruptly when I spotted Trent leaning smugly against my Subaru's driver's side door preventing my entry. Here we go again. Well, isn't this cozy, he offered sarcastically, gesturing to the law office. Nothing like conspiring with shady lawyers instead of trying to salvage our sacred marriage vows. I scoffed at this warped perspective. I hardly think a healthy marriage involves one partner selfishly demanding assets and demolishing property without consent. Now please move. You're blocking my car. Trent stepped defiantly in front of the handle as I reached to open it. His height had always given him an intimidation advantage. I refused to cower this time. Not until you agree to a mediation session with a counselor, Trent demanded. I'm sure once you explain yours fairly to an expert, they will set you straight about what you are entitled or not to. 
I nearly gagged at this attempt to silence me by making my protests seem irrational and uninformed. I glared directly at him with emboldened confidence. I know precisely what I'm entitled to, Trent, and I have an extensive, well-documented legal team securing it without manipulation. You will not cheat me out of my due compensation. His smug veneer flickered briefly with doubt. My audacity clearly hit a nerve. Regaining composure, Trent pressed closer, his stale coffee breath assaulting my senses. Careful, Eliza. You seem to have forgotten who ensured you lived so well all this time. Threaten my reputation and I'll reduce you to dirt. Though his words raised the hairs on my arms, I didn't flinch. We stood face to face in taut silence, twins titans at the peak of a perilous precipice. I broke the tension calmly. Feel free to sling threats if it makes you feel powerful, Trent but we both know you stand to lose far more than I do here. With strength belying my trembling core, I peered unwavering into his dark eyes. Now for the last time. Get away from my vehicle. You no longer dictate my life. A charged beat passed where anything could have transpired. To my relief, Trent scowled bitterly then stepped aside, grumbling. I maintained vigilant composure despite quaking inside, safely driving off without glancing back. Maintaining courage through intimidation tactics was not easy, but I now I realized the breadth of my fortitude, and nothing was stronger than a determined woman protecting her interests against a greedy bully. Game on, Trent. Your reckoning awaits. I tapped my foot impatiently, glancing between my watch and the imposing courthouse doors. Claire and I had filed the paperwork, petitioning for financial separation over a month ago, and the court date had finally arrived. Yet despite the early hour, Trent was characteristically late, no doubt a feeble attempt to regain control by making me wait anxiously. Little did he know I had reached a state of zen. The law was on my side. Fifteen tedious minutes later, Trent came swaggering up the marble steps, not a hair out of place in his arrogantly confident power suit. I offered a cordial smile. Nice of you make an appearance, Trent. Shall we proceed? He bristled at my unruffled demeanor, but nodded but nodded curtly. I led the way into the expansive courtroom as we took our respective places at the defendant's tables. Claire entered soon after, flanked by our other legal aides, nodding reassurance. I kept my breath steady, visualizing victory as the bailiff called court into session. This was it, judgment day, for Trent's deceit. The proceedings commenced efficiently, with Claire masterfully presenting our evidence of emotional abuse and financial coercion. The judge listened solemnly, eyes widening at particularly shocking voicemails from Trent maligning my character. I had to hand it to Claire. She had crafted an utterly unimpeachable case. After what seemed an eternity, the judge cleared her throat, peering sternly over spectacles. In light of the comprehensive evidence provided, I hereby grant the petition for dissolution of shared finances. All assets and inheritance shall remain exclusive property of Eliza the plaintiff. I nearly collapsed with relief and triumph. Glancing to my right, I noticed Trent turning a shade of crimson I hadn't witnessed since Sophie's terrible twos tantrums. Veins bulged from his neck as he sputtered incoherently trying to interject. The gavel pounded authoritatively, silencing him. Sweet victory. Additionally, in consideration of documented mental abuse, I'm granting Eliza full legal and physical custody of both minor children, the judge continued firmly. At this, Trent slammed his fists furiously on the tabletop, sending pens flying wildly. This is outrageous, he roared, spit flying. That money is rightfully mine, and you can't take my kids, Eliza. Before the bailiff could react, Trent sent the defendant's table crashing onto its side with a violent shove. He fixed his crazed eyes on me, shouting accusations as security restrained him. Rather than engage, I simply gathered my belongings calmly as he was dragged out, kicking and screaming. "'You've made a grave mistake,' he hollered among straining security guards. "'I'll take back what's mine, Eliza. This isn't over.' His lasting threats echoed down the marbled hall as I strode out to meet Claire with a confident smile. "'Congratulations, Eliza,' Claire grinned as we stepped into sunshine beyond the imposing columns. "'You are now a very wealthy, single woman.' and Trent's hysterics surely didn't help his appeal to the judge. Well done maintaining composure. I let out a deep exhale, feeling years of anxiety and oppression lifting away. Thank you sincerely. I couldn't have navigated this without your counsel. In more ways than one, I chuckled.
We exchanged relieved embraces before Claire headed off to handle newly freed up caseload. Meanwhile, I slid into my Subaru's driver's seat, finally feeling its true owner. Trent's desperate threats didn't phase my cooler state of mind. His burst of outrage proved powerless against the justice system, securing my rights irrevocably. Any sway he once held over me was crushed under the mighty gavel of truth. I turned the ignition key feeling renewed energy course through the previously strained vehicle. Trent had monopolized the driver's seat of my life for too long. But with his recklessly controlling hands finally off the wheel, I cruised eagerly onward down the open road toward independence. Mom, that creme brulee was amazing! Lucas grinned, leaning back contentedly after our celebratory dinner at the upscale French bistro. We definitely have to come back here. I smiled at my son, who was home on a short break before summer internships ramped up. With Trent temporarily absent from family life, the cloud of tension had lifted. Sophie squeezed my hand affectionately from across the table. I'm so proud of you for standing up to Dad, Mom. You deserve that win in court, she offered sincerely. I swelled with gratitude to have my children close again without fear of callous comments shattering tender moments. As we strolled outside the restaurant, Lucas suddenly gripped my arm, nodding towards the bar next door. There sat Trent, half slumped on a stool, staring numbly at CNN, blaring predictions for an upcoming economic recession. Even from a distance, his unkempt appearance revealed a broken man. I felt Sophie's hand tense on my shoulder. Let's go, Mom, she urged gently. I paused, taking in the scene of my once formidable opponent, diminished to a drunken shell of spite. His legacy and reputation apparently lay in shambles, much like the remains of our demolished home. Investors and elite executives had shunned him after his court outburst made salacious headlines. Rumor was his assets had taken a significant hit in the latest stock market plunge as well. The community backlash only amplified his downfall. Karma's a beast, eh, Trent? Lucas muttered. Seeing his disheveled father still sparked sadness behind the resentment in Lucas's eyes. Sophie linked her arm through his comfortingly as they walked ahead to gather an Uber. I stood frozen gazing upon the aftermath of Trent's greed and hubris. Claire was right. He had far more to lose than me by refusing to compromise. Now every manipulative scheme and sociopathic threat had come crashing down in a brutal reckoning. Hard times humbled even the proudest titans. Though my righteous anger towards Trent persisted, witnessing his self-destruction awakened traces of pity amongst the bitterness. Perhaps if he demonstrated true remorse and sought help for underlying issues driving his egocentric worldview— my sympathetic pondering was cut short when Trent glanced up blearily from his drink. His bloodshot eyes registered rage seeing me. He rose unsteadily and staggered over, wearing a twisted smirk. Come to gloat, have you? He slurred, whiskey breath assaulting my senses. Little Miss Righteous Victor. Trent wobbled, but spite sharpened his words. I stood calmly meeting his hollow glare. No, Trent, just heading home after dinner with our kids, actually. I do hope you'll get the help you need. Before I could finish, Trent erupted in a spit-flying diatribe. Save your sanctimonious talk. This is your fault, Eliza. Your papetti comeuppance threats me destitute and despised. He swayed aggressively closer. I lost everything because of your self-centered vengeance. Sensing the confrontation escalating, I stepped cautiously back, gesturing to the approaching bartender for assistance. Trent was clearly beyond logical exchange in his inebriated rage. His unhinged tirade continued attracting shocked attention from passers-by. Mark my words, Eliza. I will get even. Your little celebratory parade ends now? He lunged towards me as the bartender grabbed him. I retreated quickly to where Lucas and Sophie stood horrified. Police sirens wailed from down the street responding to calls about the disturbance. Let's go home, I urged, ushering my shaken children away from the nightmarish scene. Glancing back, I glimpsed Trent being shoved into a squad car, drunkenly raging about comeuppance as they sped away. The vengeance Trent had poisonously plotted was now his own ruin woven by greed. And despite his threats, watching him fade, unhinged and unwell in flashing police lights, I pitied more than feared the broken, bitter man. A year had passed since that tumultuous night witnessing Trent unravel completely. His drunken threats persisted for months between jail sentences and court-ordered rehab sessions. 
but word was he had finally accepted a lenient sentence at an upstate center specializing in anger issues and financial disorders. With Trent's toxicity no longer poisoning my home space, I began envisioning how to rebuild, starting with restoring the literal foundation he had callously crushed. On a refreshingly mild Saturday morning, I stood smiling with Lucas and Sophie on the vacant lot where our family home once stood sturdy for decades. Claire snapped photos capturing the hopeful moment as we broke ground to construct a new dwelling, not haunted by residual darkness. I'm so proud of you, Mom, Sophie repeated, squeezing my shoulder. This is a fresh start for all of us. I surveyed the space, buzzing with construction crews hauling lumber, while Lucas and I discussed potential layouts. Trent's devastating demolishment had crushed more than bricks and mortar. But rising resilient from the rubble, I would forge new sanctuaries for my children, devoid of oppressive shadows. Over the next year, tangible rebuilding progressed in tandem with inner healing. With each golden beam raised and brick mortared in place, I sensed our spirits mending as well. Soon the lingering wounds from Trent's destruction would be more scar tissue than open gash. On a crisp autumn afternoon, I gathered with loved ones to celebrate the finished product, a gorgeous contemporary farmhouse blending vintage charm with sleek upgrades. Sophie and Lucas had invited college friends. Supportive relatives filled the home with infectious laughter. As caterers circulated with champagne to commemorate the occasion, I paused to admire photos adorning the fireplace mantle. Images of my parents smiled down filled with eternal light and love despite their earthly absence. Gazing around at those present, additional missing faces stood out painfully. Trent's parents had shown their true colors aligning firmly with their son despite incriminating evidence against him. And Trent himself sat stewing in isolation, still too prideful to take accountability. Their self-imposed misery was punishment enough. Occasional pangs of sadness resurfaced, missing the man Trent used to be, before ambition consumed him. But focusing forward allowed me to appreciate life's everyday joys again, instead of dwelling on toxic relationships. Later after guests had dispersed with hearty congratulations and housewarming bouquets, Sophie joined me on the front porch gazing up at constellations glittering optimistically. She broke the pensive silence. Dad sent me a brief letter today from the rehab center. It sounds like intensive counseling is helping him finally reflect more on the consequences of his actions. Though skeptical about authentic transformation from brief therapy, I nodded. That's promising. Real change takes time, though. I hugged Sophie in closer. But the most crucial relationships to fortify are right here with people committed to lifting us higher. Sophie smiled up brightly through tears glinting in the moonlight. In her strength and sensitivity, my greatest co-creation glowed. She would perpetuate cycles of compassion, not malice. Together we sat in meditative silence connected to forces intricately crafting redemption from ruin. Though scars remained, Trent's corrosion had only illuminated my resilient spirit. His darkness merely fertilized future flowers determined to keep blooming. 